we were trying to do something different. We're in the studio, John Pino, myself, and uh, as I've grown as a musician, I stopped thinking in terms of beats. You know, like when you're a drummer, you you know, what beat am I gonna play on this song, whatever. He said, well, you haven't even heard the song yet. And you're starting to trying to figure out what beat you're gonna play on it. That's like the most unmusical thing that you could do, which is why there's so many drummer jokes. So once I realized that that was completely ridiculous, thank God I figured that out. I just play the song first. But in this case, we were jamming and sometimes I'll just start playing a feel. I wanted to do something different. I wanted, you know, we were gonna be rocking and I wanted to have some extra juice and this thing just came to me. And John was like, whoa. And then he's like, you know, and the whole thing just started happening. And then Pino, you know, just started doing that thing, you know, that he does. And, and it's a, it was a power trio setting, you know. Uh, so those were the guardrails. Those were a power trio type of vibe. I wanted to be funky, but it's gotta be rocking, it's gotta swing. And I didn't consciously think of those things before I started to play. It's all, it's already there. So, you know, it just started to happen, you know. I don't try to make uh, retro records. I just want to make records that have the sensibility of the stuff that was good about the time. But you can't imitate something that was already perfect. You want to take the best qualities of that stuff and then make it your own. Because that stuff is timeless. Something that's timeless is timeless. The, there are certain instruments that don't, like for instance, a bad synth sound, you know? That ain't gonna last, you know, for a couple of years, it's like the coolest thing ever, and then three, four years later, is like, take that thing off, turn that off, please. Um, and the same thing with the drum sound. I think that over the years, I've been able to get a more timeless sound as I've been able to learn more about recording. Um, there are certain things that I would never do again, you know. When I was younger, I played way too much. That, that, but that's a playing thing, that's not necessarily a production thing, because I wasn't really a quote unquote producer at the time, I was learning about production. So I filled up a lot of space when I was younger, you know, but that's because you have a lot of energy. I mean, like for instance, the Blues Brothers record, that was a contemporary take on the blues, so it made sense at the time. And I was so proud of Briefcase Full of Blues. But if I listened to it, and knowing what I know about the blues now, I can't listen to it because it's scary. it's frightening, you know? It's like I played way too much, the tempos are way too fast. Everything is just like, whoa. And a perfect example, is if you listen to our version of Soul Man, which was no, went, went to number one and very successful, but if you listen to the original Soul Man and you hear Al Jackson. I remember the first time I heard the original after we did our version, I almost had a nervous breakdown. That's a perfect example of something that is timeless. If you put Soul Man on right now, it's one of the baddest things you'll ever hear. If you heard, put our version on, I'm going. You know, because that was, you know, hip at the time and everything like that. Believe me, that ain't working. The extra space, instead of that push, it's a different kind of push. It's a laid back push. It's not a New York hyper push. It's a physical thing. You know, it affects you. Uh, most drummers hit the J 
drum, but they don't start and stop a note. You, you hit the drum, but you don't start, stop the note. Now, when I play timpani, because I play timpani first, when you're playing the timpani and you're reading music, you so you, you understand the full value of a quarter note or a half note or a whole note. You're not just hitting the drum and letting it ring. That, that's not what the music calls for. So once you realize the length of a quarter note, that opens up a whole nother world. That gives you the gateway into what time is. So when you start working with a metronome and you really start to hone the definition of what a quarter note is, then you can see how wide a quarter note can be. The distance between two notes can be an ocean, you know, and once you, it's kind of like once you really get into it and really start to focus on it, it's kind of like you can get into a zone, you know, like when Michael Jordan got into the zone and the basket seemed like it was this big, he couldn't miss, that type of thing. Once you really get in there and, and really break down time and really slow things down, you can really see and feel the beauty of the space between two notes, between two quarter notes. stole that beat from a very good friend of mine, a person who's a big influence on my playing, a brother named Greg Errico, the original drummer from Sly and the Family Stone. He played that beat on. One of the first things I started to play to as a kid was Sly and the Family Stone record. I think like either Everyday People or Everybody's a Star, Sim Sing a Simple Song, one of those, because they were he was having hits after hits. After, and that was Greg. And that's how I started to learn how to open and close the cymbal. I didn't even know. I didn't know how to <laughs> manipulate this, the whole thing because I started as... Uh, playing in orchestras and stuff. So I had, I read music and I had, I played concert snare. And all that stuff. And played timpani, but I didn't have a drum set, you know. Full circle, years later we become very good friends. I consider him one of my closest buds in the music world. When I was going to uh, Northern California to record a uh, record with Keith, we were doing uh, one of the solo records. Greg wanted some new cymbals, and I said, oh yeah, can I, uh, and he said, I'll swap you out some cymbals. And I got and gave him some new Paiste cymbals. And in the swap, I ended up with the hi-hat cymbals from those records that he played on those records. It's incredible. So I actually have, the only pair of 14-inch cymbals that I use are those cymbals from those records. And then later on, I started to get into bigger cymbals, and a friend of mine, Charlie Drayton, was using some bigger cymbals as well. We were experimenting with that. I think he started getting into bigger cymbals. But I was really, really inspired by the drummer for Creedence Clearwater Revival. He used like 18s or something. I mean, they were gigantic. And what a sound, you know, Green River, if you listen to any of those Creedence records, first of all, whether you like Creedence or hate Creedence, whatever, those records are amazing. And his drumming is tremendous. And so as I tried to formulate my own sound, um, that was very integral part of my thing. And then when I started to play bebop more, or when I went back to Sonny Rollins after not playing for a long time with Sonny. You 
you can ride on the cymbals. You don't really do that with 14s. Now, sometimes you might miss the You know, in 14s, that, that, that backbeat thing is a little crisper. So you sacrifice that. But to ride on the 17, That to me is so fantastic, and that's a whole nother color. And I really utilized that a lot when I went back to Sonny Rollins and played with him. There's so much meat. There was a time when I really got tired of the hi-hats in general especially the 14s, because the, the hi-hat got into, first of all, it got into every mic. And they were a little bit too high-pitched, so it was always sticking out. It was never, you, could, you know, most engineers, they don't even use the hi-hat fader. It's always, on, you know, down. But when I realized the, the bigger cymbals, they blend in more with the drums. Your ear doesn't go right to it, so it's not like, ah, the hi-hat, ah. And then... It's more musical, and it blends more, and then it can, then it, it drives in a different way. Then you can really hear what the Hyatt is doing is, instead of annoying you, it's in there moving. It's moving the track now. So when, if I was playing that on 14s, it'd be like, you'd be like ah! but now, And to me, that's more fun. You know, and you don't have to hit them as hard. You can use more finesse. All of a sudden, now you can turn the thing on because, you know, it's not like the thing where you don't want to know about it. <laughs> 